Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, you know, food and fellowship here starts at 8 p.m. Uh, we'd like to see everybody and don't forget the meeting after the meeting when we're finished here. Uh, it's an important part of the meeting but before uh, the meeting and after the meeting. So if you're struggling with anything, please see us. Our sister group meets on Thursday. It's over at Salem UCC Church. It's a big book study. We go line by line. You know, it's, it's a pretty powerful meeting in the sense that, have you ever, you, you ever been to a meeting where we go a whole hour without any profanity or complaint? You know, we, we try to stay strictly into the program of recovery. And it's amazing how when people apply this thing in their lives, how they have a transformation and get free, and they get to enjoy life. And so we always like to communicate uh, how important it is to have, you know, uh, exposure to recovery and to enjoy Sobriety. I don't know about you guys, but I was always taught that if I'm if I'm not having fun and I'm not enjoying sobriety, I'm doing it wrong. So hopefully, uh, we we search out some of the best speakers that we can possibly find anywhere that are willing to come here at their own time and expense, and uh, a message of hope and recovery. And uh, we we all, a friend of mine just came down from the Lehigh Valley looking for speakers. It's not as easy as you would think to find in the, in, in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous a speaker that, that has a, a message of, of hope and recovery on a consistent basis. And that's so important because that was important to me when I got here, that people would, would share that message with me because I was hopeless and I knew nothing about recovery. And that's what we try to do here. And so each and every one of us at this group come here for a specific reason, to be of service. That's it. That's the only reason we come to AA. And, and because somebody was here before us, and put their hand out and showed us the way out of this. So that's what we try to do with you guys. And hopefully, uh, if you're struggling, you're, you're able to uh, come and just hang with us. We're just regular people. We're, we're abnormal alcoholics like the rest of us, so I don't think there's anything special. Or this is, We're all inclusive and never exclusive, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, our chairperson is Kara today. She's gonna come up here and uh, enjoy. Hello everybody, my name's Kara and I'm an alcoholic. Hello everybody, we're glad that you're here tonight. Uh, welcome to the Conscious Contact Speaker Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a one hour speaker meeting that meets every Saturday evening at St. Paul Lutheran Church, 301 North Main Street at 8.30 p.m. in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. Food and fellowship starts at 8 p.m. The business meeting for this group meets every Saturday, 7 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. right here. The purpose of this group is to provide a consistent message of hope and recovery through God, reliance, and service to others through the practice and teaching of the 12 steps. We record all speakers so that others may benefit from their message of recovery. If you wish not to be recorded, simply ask. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. The group would like to welcome everyone, especially newcomers. Is there anyone new or from out of town that would like to introduce themselves with their first name only? Uh, welcome. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. The contest contact speaker group encourages sponsorship. Would anyone with working knowledge of the 12 steps and is willing to sponsor please raise their hands? Are there any announcements for the good of AA? We have meeting lists and big books on easy terms. Please see me or any home group member after the meeting. If you cannot afford a big book, the Conscious Contact Speaker Group will give you one at no charge. Anyone willing to make donations for the purpose of big books and CDs to help those who cannot afford them, put, please put don donations in the jar at the table marked big book and C CD donations. If you would like a CD of any speaker, past or present, see, see me or any home group member before or after the meeting. They are available free of charge. Now I would like to ask Tina to come up and read the preamble. Hey everyone, I'm Tina, I'm an alcoholic. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who, who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and to help others recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. 
AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And I've asked Sherry to come and read the 12 steps of recovery. I'm an alcoholic. The A 12 Steps of Recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10, continued to take personal inventory and when we were, pro <laughs> sorry, <laughs> continued to take personal inventory and we were, when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, saw through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Thank you. Thank you. The seventh tradition states every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. At this time, I would like to pass the basket. We have no fee dues or fees, but we have expenses. This group provides many services. Your donations cover rent, big books, CDs, events, and workshops, etc. There's absolutely no smoking on church property. Please take a moment to silence all cell phones and limit movement during the meeting to avoid distractions. Now, we'd like to introduce a good friend of the uh, introduce the speaker, a good friend of the Conscious Contact speaker, Lucinda of New Jersey. Let's give her a warm welcome. Woo! Okay. Whew. Okay. Hi, my name is Lucinda and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, everyone. Okay, um, I always get really nervous in the beginning and I don't know why because you guys are just like me and I've never been more accepted in my whole life than in these rooms and I still get nervous all these years. So, um, where do I start? Okay, so I'm from New Jersey. Um, I was born in Miami, adopted by a family from New Jersey and grew up in New Jersey. Um, I grew up in a gorgeous town, great downtown, great friends. Um, two parents that tolerated each other enough to, you know, make it seem like a happy family for me. And I had two younger, I have two younger siblings that are twins that are my best friends. Um, super close with all of them, super close family, super just everyone. Like I, I grew up in a great home. Um, but it wasn't enough for me. I always was just finding problems. You know, um, my dad worked too much, or then it turned into my dad hung out with too many alcoholics, you know, and that to me when I was younger, I was like, why are all these alcoholics in our house all the time? Why are people, my dad's in the program, and I didn't understand what AA was. I just knew that there were people in my house talking about God, talking about not drinking, and I was like, what? That's weird. Like, why can't they drink? Um, I was like, you know, and then um, my mom started hanging out with people that were alcoholics, and they were talking about not drinking, and I was like, this is so weird. 
So then I go to my friend's house like any kid does, and I'm like, do your parents' friends like not drink, and do they talk about it in the kitchen a lot? Um, and that resulted in a phone call to my parents and then eventually breaking their anonymity that they're in the program, and oops, you know, small town, once one family, you know, finds out, all the families find out. And uh, that was great because then my house became, oh, well, if we know that there's no alcohol in that house, so it's okay if the girls sleep over there for the weekend. Um, so I always had people over. I always, you know, was a social kid. I played sports. Um, I volunteered. I was a Girl Scout. Um, on paper, perfect, you know, and could get into any school I wanted to, but I didn't want to go to school. Um, what did I want? When I was 14 years old, I wanted to drop out because I was bored in class and I just didn't like going, so I stopped going. Um, I wanted to hang out with the people that I thought were fun and exciting, and those were the kids that we were, you know, out by the field drinking or cheating on tests or just doing what they weren't supposed to be doing. I was attracted to the people that broke the rules because um, it excited me, you know? And when you have two parents that are both in the program, they recognize those behaviors and it was shot down right away. Um, they weren't like, oh, you're, you're an alcoholic. Because at that time, you know, I wasn't really drinking. I was only drinking on holidays. Um, and newsflash, update, I'm Jewish. So you drink a lot on Jewish holidays. And that's the only time I was going to drink because we were at relatives' houses and alcohol was around. Um, and so I used to get so excited, you know, because there was never a way to drink in my house. And there, I didn't know how to get alcohol. Like, I didn't understand the concept of a liquor store. It just wasn't, you know, I felt... <laughs> I felt because both my parents were in recovery, my knowledge of how to get alcohol was very messed up. I just didn't understand like a liquor store. Um, I didn't, back then there weren't like apps to have it delivered to you or anything. Um, it was, you know, hard, really hard times. And I, by the fact I was like only 14. Um, so by this, that summer I was 15 and I was a full-blown alcoholic. I mastered the system. I knew who to go to. I knew who was my best friend of the week. And once I like sealed from them enough, I knew who to go to next. Um, and I was good. You know, I would uh, skip around to different groups. You know, because I never liked to get too comfortable with one group. Um, I couldn't get too vulnerable because once you finish the bottle, they start asking questions like, "How are you doing? Like, oh, like, how was that test you took? Like." I don't want to talk to you about how I'm doing or what tests I took or did not take. Most likely I did not take at the time. Um, there was just not what I, I wanted to keep drinking. And if you weren't going to keep the party going, I was going to leave you. And that's what I did. Um, so I hopped around from group to group. And then eventually, you know, it just progressed to, I don't really need any groups, you know? Like I know the source. I don't, you know, need to fake it and just be nice to all these people. I can just do it myself. I'm a one-woman show. And to me, I was like, wow. Like, look at me. I am so independent. You know, like, I thought I was, you know, a self-made alcoholic. Like, I was just, you know, didn't need to lie to anyone. I can just do it myself. And um, by this time, I was getting caught a lot. You know, I was having some issues. I was getting out of trouble. Um... And I just realized I'm really good at manipulating people. You know, I can pull the adoption card and that will get me, you know, a few like, okay, we understand, just don't do it again. Or I can pull, you know, well, my depression has been really bad this month and like, it's the only thing that's helping. And, you know, that'd be like, okay, well, let's, you know, let's not drink this too much and we'll try and get you on better medication. There was always some card I could pull, um, there was always something. And then eventually it got to the point where I was going away for um, a girls weekend. I don't even know, I was 16. I don't know why you have girls weekends when you're 16, but I felt like that's what you do when you're like a mature woman. So my friends and I had a girls weekend. Um, and we couldn't even drive then, but we had our parents drive us down the shore and 
um, we had a girls weekend down the shore. And when you're 16 and you're unsupervised at the Jersey Shore, all you do is drink. And all you do is, you know, go into places that you can't usually go into if you're an underage. Um, and my friends were scared of me. And they were talking bad about me all, the whole trip. And I knew it. And I just didn't care. I was like, listen, you are providing me with plans to get drunk. You're providing me with alcohol. And you're providing me a way home. Talk all you want about me. I don't care. Um, and I did. And to this day, I'm not friends with any of them. But that's what happened. I eventually just lost it all. I hit a point where my friends that I thought were my friends for life just talked bad about me and they started to keep me around because I was a fun story. Um, like, oh, like, do you know you did that last weekend? Or like, I was blacking out every weekend at this point and had no recollection of what I was doing or, you know, who I was cursing out or what I had said to my mother when she caught me or whatnot. Um, and it just escalated extremely within, uh, I want to say like six months. And then there was just one night, you know, my parents were trying to talk to me about, you know, treatment options that weekend and it, I was not having it. And, you know, I had a lot of, what's the word? I had a lot of mm in me where I'm 16 years old and I thought that, you know, yes, you pay for everything I have in my life and you, you know, I am fully dependent on you, but i rather leave you and never talk to you again than stop drinking. Um, I told my mother she was not my mother, that I said, you just bought me and I was, I'm your problem now and you can't handle it. Um, that's horrible to say to someone. That's hard. Like my mom's my best friend. I love her to death. Saying that to her, horrible. Um, my brother, you know, my little brother, crying to me. Please stop doing this. You're making everyone upset. It's always about you. It's always about you. I love that. I love that it was always about me. Like, yeah, it is always about me. Like, you're like you're 12. Like, who cares about your life at 12? You know. Um, just no disregard to anyone else in the family. I was the only child that mattered. Um, and my parents were like, you're going away. And I said, no, I'm not. You know, and I locked myself in my room and you know, I had all my friends I needed and everyone I needed in my room and those were my bottles. And I drank all weekend. And you know, they tried to get in and then they just gave up. And I was so hurt that they gave up. Even though I wanted them to give up, you know, I kept saying, go away. Like, leave me alone. I'm not talking to you. When they stopped checking in on me, I remember I was just like, wow. Like, I don't, I don't like this feeling. And when I don't like a feeling, what I do is drink. But I was out. And I just lost it. I went into full, you know, mania. And I just started freaking out in my room. And, like, they had to come in. And to this day, I think that, you know, like, that was my higher power because if my parents didn't come in, who knows what, what would have happened. But, you know, they came in and I just fell into my parents' arms and I just said, I want to go somewhere. Please take me somewhere. Um, and then that next morning, you know, I was getting driven to somewhere in Pennsylvania. And <laughs> to this day, I really don't know the town. I know what the facility is, but I don't know the town. Um, getting driven there that next morning and I'm like, oh no. Uh, I, I was a moment of weakness, I, I didn't mean it, I'm fine, like no. no. And like, it was, I'm sitting in the middle seat, in the back seat, both like uh, doors are locked and I'm just like, like tunnel vision on the road and it just looks like the end of my life. And I was just, please, like, I was like, I was, you know, I was begging my dad, please pull over, please turn around, please, you know, like I'll do anything. And in the past, I, you know, have gotten him to turn around from places before. So I was like, I can do it again. I was like, I have two hours, two hours to just, you know, use all the tricks I have. And um, now he didn't pull over. And I was like, I was praying that we would crash the car. It was that bad. I did not want to go. And that's horrible to say. 
nothing like, you know, I was like, please God, like, you know, let us crash. I don't want to die. I don't want anyone to die, but like, let us crash, you know? Um, and that didn't happen either. And we pull up and, and it was like scary. Like they're doing like all these like lingo, like rehab lingo I never heard of, like talking about like DOC and I'm like, what's that? And you know, these girls are like really scary and I'm like, I don't belong here. Like I showed up in like a juicy couture tracksuit to rehab and these girls are in sweats and look like they want to like jump me. And I'm like, dad, please, like, I'm so sorry. I'm, so, I'm, I'm calling my, like, and it was horrible. And I just remember, like, I was like, I don't belong here. Like, I'm not one of them. I'm not, I remember, I kept saying, that. like, I'm not one of these girls. Like, these girls are going to fight me. They're going to kill me. You're never going to see your daughter again. Like, I was I, refusing to get out of the car. And, you know, they're talking, my we're in the office and he's filling out the paperwork and she's trying to make it seem like it's so nice you know you know we have this here we you know you have arts and crafts and you know you're you're going to do school here we have on-site school and you know you can still like finish out the year and we have the gym and I was just like there's I was like why do I want that why do I want to work out why do I want to go to class like why do I like want to do arts and crafts like what is this like I was uh it was horrible back then it was um Honestly, to this day, I re if I'm being really honest with you guys, if someone told me that I had to, like, go away somewhere and do arts and crafts all day and, like, work out, I would still think it's horrible. Um, just the whole working out thing. Like, it was mandatory back then. And it was horrible. I didn't pack one gym clothes. I didn't even pack a sneaker. Um, horrible. And my first night in rehab, I was 16 years old. It was... A Monday night and it sucked sat there and I was just crying like bawling my eyes out and then all of a sudden around like sometime in the middle of the night some girl walks in and I say you have a roommate fine I wipe the tears away I like go into the bathroom I like slap myself in the face a few times I come out and I'm, I'm a new person and I just like I just changed my personality to survivor mode and I was just like sup like who are you I was like what's your DOC like literally 12 hours later I had no idea what that, I, before I had no idea what that was but that's what I did like I had to it was survival mode like I really felt like I had to survive in there um and I came up with this master plan and I thought I was going to trick the system and I thought all right I'm going to get out 30 days I can do it let me just say yes to everything they say. Let me say that I have a problem. Let me just show that I'm so desperate and I really want to be sober. Let me just do it. Like, they're not going to see it coming. Um, so that's what I did. You know, I go to the first group and I'm like, I have such a problem and I can't stop and I really just want to get better. Like, I love my life and I don't know why this is happening. Like, please help me. I will do anything you say. I kept saying that the first, like, week in group. And then I was called out on it right away. And she goes, we know you're faking it. We know you want to leave and you're not going to leave. <laughs> and I was like, no, like, tell my parents I'm doing good. Like, I really want this. They're like, we told your parents that you're faking your way through this. <laughs> um, so then that began my, like, began, like, rehab, you know. I was, I was, you know, I'm not going to lie. Like, I probably, the, until my last week there, I did not take it seriously. I didn't think I had a problem until we had one speaker and I was like, and listen, I don't know what happened, but this guy, you know, he was like this tall, n no hair, like, like, I, like, like beer belly, but hasn't, didn't drink in like 25 years at that point. And it, it, everything he said was me. Like everything he said was me. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like I was crying. Like, and I just let everyone see me cry. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, that's me. That's going to be me if I keep drinking. And then I just started, like, I had an anxiety attack in a meeting. And I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. It was, you know. And I was like, and then I got mad at myself. And then I got, because I was like, I just wasted, you know, like, all this time denying everything and just faking it. And I have a problem. I'm leaving in a week, and I'm not going to get any better. And I'm going to end up like this guy. And I was freaking out. And then I was... I built this resentment towards the rehab because I was like, they should have this guy come in my first week. They knew what I was like. They had me take all these personality tests. Why did they wait? I was, you know, like I was 
mad. I was mad. And so I came home um, and I thought everything was going to get better. I was like, I'm ready. I'm ready to take on the world. A meetings, I got it. You know, 12 steps, let's do it. Big book, I already have one. Like, so ready. Um, and yeah, no, my first meeting I went to when I got home was a 5.30 meeting in the town over. And I was like super excited to like, you know, go. My parents were with me and I was like, I'm gonna show them like what I've learned. It was like show and tell. Um, I walk in, I sit down, like super like ready. It was like a job interview. I was like, all right, let's do this. And you know, they go around introducing people and I'm like looking. It's a teacher from my school. And I'm like, oh my gosh, no, nope, can't do it, can't do it. Um, I was like, I can't. There's teachers here, there's people I know, like I can't do it. Um, and that happened to me a lot in early sobriety. I would see teachers, I would see parents, you know, coaches. And that's like super embarrassing for me, I thought. But that's probably super embarrassing for them. Like they don't want to see me there. But again, I'm selfish and everything's about me. So I'm just thinking how it sucks for me. Um, but, you know, they all knew. Like I didn't understand. Like meanwhile, when I was in rehab, my mom went to my locker at my school and 16 handles fell out of my locker. And she put them all in her purse and carried them like this to the hallway dropped them on the principal's desk and said, this was in my daughter's locker, just so you know. Um, so I was, you know, homeschooled after that for a while. They didn't want me back there, um, which I thought was like ridiculous because I was like, I wasn't the only one doing it. I was just the only one that got caught. It's not my fault. Um, and, you know, life after rehab, I'm 16, about to be 17 at this point, you know, I had to take my, like, permit test, and they don't teach you that in rehab, like, they don't teach you how to drive a car, like, they don't really trust you to go to the bathroom yourself, they're not going to teach you how to drive a car, so that was not easy for me, and, like, I cheated on my permit test, and I told the guy, I I'm going to cheat on this if I pass. I was very honest in early sobriety, I was very honest, and I cheated. And he like felt bad for me and he like gave me answers. He's like, and he's like, well, if you're parking up a hill, which way are you going to turn your steering? Like, where are your tires going to go? I didn't get that. And he was like, let's play with this like toy uh, car. Where? And I was just like, that's like, that was my new card, the rehab card. I was in rehab. I didn't learn this. Um, I, so I got my permit. That was great. But you know, I really had nowhere to go except for AA meetings and like they're at night so they were past curfew so I couldn't drive. So literally AA was just my life. Um, I would wake up, I would do homeschool, call my sponsor at my lunch time, then go to a meeting at night. And that was my life for six months. Um, and I never saw anyone my age. And I was like, this sucks. Like no one's my age, there's something wrong. I was like, maybe I'm just a depressed kid. Like maybe I'm just depressed. And once that started coming into like my head and I was just like, I was like, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe like, you know, I was just going through a really rough time. Maybe I just have an attitude problem that could, can, they can fix. Um, and, you know, there was just, I was at a meeting that my dad started in our town and he had a, spo a sponsee at the time. And this kid was probably about like six years older than me. Um, and he made him drive, like, he drove me to meetings. My dad's like, yeah, like, you're going to be my sponsee, like, you're going to drive my daughter to meetings. Um, so that was my new friend. Um, and it was horrible. He thought he was going to be a SoundCloud rapper, so he, like, rapped all the time in the car. And, like, to this day, he's, like, one of my best friends, and, like, I love him dearly, and, like, we always joke about it. And, um, but, like, that was, like, that was horrible, like, going to meetings that were an hour away, like an hour of him rapping there and an hour of him rapping home. But that was like what I looked forward to, you know? And then I started going to meetings farther away. I, you know, branched out, I made new friends and I started meeting people my own age. And then I all of a sudden didn't feel like, you know, that weird 17 year old going to meetings. You know, I didn't feel like, oh, like 
it, I can't be an alcoholic, I'm too young. You know, that was like the whole thing. Like, I know I have a problem, but I'm too young. I'm too young. Um, I didn't believe that, you know, the life or death. I really didn't. You know, I didn't think that I was going to die because I'm just too young. Um, yeah. So I spent about a year. I celebrated a year sober when I was 18 or no, 17, yeah, 17, and it was great, you know, um, I was doing good in school, I got into a new private school, and I was getting my grades up, and I was, you know, still playing sports, and I got back into, like, fashion, I got back into, like, doing all my creative stuff, and I had a lot of fun in sobriety, you know, like, I would, I had a schedule, like, I, my friends and I we would rent a beach house, you know, during the summer, and, that's great because none of them talked about me. You know, last time I was down the shore with like so-called friends, they were talking about me and saying that I was drinking like crazy and I was like a fish. You know, now I'm down the shore with all my new friends that are sober and I'm having the best time of my life. And you know, we would do dinners and we would go to meetings. Like we would, it's a boring Friday night. We're like, all right, let's just play meeting roulette. And we would go on the app, like the phone app, and you would scroll and scroll, and you say stop, and whatever meeting you pick on for the night, that's the meeting you go to. And we would do that, and it was just so much fun. Um, and then it wasn't fun for me anymore because I got content. You know, I uh, at this time I was about to graduate high school, and I was going to a college in the city, and I was just like, this isn't fun. This isn't what everyone else is doing. I would look on Instagram or I'd look on Facebook, and I would see. You know, everyone's at like a party or, you know, they're at a f football game or whatnot. And I wasn't. I was going to a meeting that was an hour and a half away with SoundCloud rappers and people like a variety of different ages. Like, it just wasn't fun. The things I used to appreciate just weren't the same for me. Um, and then so I got to college and I just stopped calling my sponsor. She called me a few times, I didn't answer. You know, she would message me, wouldn't answer. Um, she actually came into the city once and she was like, I'm in the city, you wanna hang out? Didn't answer her. And that's just kinda how it happened. You know, I just took myself out of AA. I decided that I was too young and I was just bored with what AA was giving me, um, you know. And that whole time I was, you know, like 16 through 17, like I, or 18, I think, yeah, 18, I didn't do the steps. I was just hanging out in AA. Um, and there were times where the steps were, you know, you know, like suggested to me, and I just said, we're not there yet. Um, and I just wasn't, and that was an issue, and I just, you know, was dry, hanging out with whoever was around that, you know, and that, you know, I got to college, and it was great, you know, like, I was having so much fun, and I was sober for the first week, and then I wasn't sober, and then it wasn't fun, but it was like, it all happened in one night, and then it just went downhill. Um, I like literally forgot I was an alcoholic and someone just handed me a drink and I just drank it and then I was like, oh wait, that doesn't feel right. Oh wait, I'm in, like, it was just, it was so removed from my mind that I was an alcoholic and I'd been going to these meetings that I just forgot. Um, and part of me like wanted to forget because I wanted to drink and I knew I was going to drink. Um, I didn't know it in my like heart, but I like in my you know alcoholic brain. It was thinking like, listen, like I'll let you think that you're doing really great right now, but when you get to college, you know that's when we're really gonna party, and that's what happened. I partied, and um, so freshman year, it was great. You know, I became like this fun little party girl, and I had all the coolest clothes because I worked at all these cool shows. And I was like, this is great. Everyone around me is getting messed up. I don't stand out. Like, these are my people. Like, 
I was like, New Jersey, they're lame. New York is where it's at. Like, sign me up. I'm here. Um, and that's what I really thought. I was like, oh, I wasn't, you know, the issue. Like, I'm not the problem. It's New Jersey. Like, those people just don't know how to, like, have a good time. New York, that's where they have a good time. These are my people. Um, no, like, not so far from the actual truth. But um, that's how it was for me. And then it got worse and worse every year. Um, and I really, t like... I was in college when this, you know, was all going around. So I take my, like, my drinking career, really, in, like, semester. So, you know, freshman year, first semester, I'm, I'm just getting back to drinking and other things. And I'm, you know, getting my, like, I'm getting back to who I used to be. There's no real damage yet. Um, winter break comes and, you know, you're supposed to go home to see your family. I made up some lie that I couldn't come home because I had a big project I needed to work on and, like, I just couldn't make it. Um, I think I went for Christmas and that was it. But like to me, that was like the perfect excuse. Um, little did I like realize that every semester you had new courses, so no projects like overlap. But like it made sense at the time, and it's I stayed in my dorm. It was pretty empty. The only people who were there were like the foreign exchange students. And we just drank all the time and like some of them were Russian and like I, I drank like a Russian and and that really like that really like ages you sometimes. And so sorry. And so I um you know I just it got worse and worse and worse. But as my drinking you know progressed, I was getting all these amazing opportunities. But I was only getting these opportunities because I was constantly out at bars or nightclubs being a drunk mess, going up to people, being like, you should hire me. I'm amazing. I do this. I work for this company. Full lies. Like, just full lies. But it, like, you know, they would remember me because I was drunk and my name is Lulu and you can't really forget a drunk Lulu. So, you know, I got all these opportunities and it was great. And then eventually, like, I kind of just stopped getting them and I was just like, What's going on? And I was friends with a, a few like good people that I, I still am in touch with, and they were like, "Listen, like, they just say that you're like a drunk mess, and that you just show up reeking of like whatever you're doing, and you know that they can't have you around clients anymore." And I was just like, "Whatever, like that's them, that's not me, like goodbye." Um, and I was crushed, like I was so embarrassed. I remember I was like, I. It's not me. It's not me. It's them. Um, it was never me. It was the problem was always other people. It was only all about me when I wanted it to be. And you know, so I got to a point where eventually I stopped talking to my parents. I didn't talk to them for about two years almost. And I remember it was at one time. My, it was my birthday, and my dad got me, like, we weren't talking at the time, but he got me, like, an iTunes gift card. And I told people, I was like, I want gift cards, but I, what I meant is, like, give me, like, Dunkin' Donuts, Chipotle, and, like, a Visa gift card. That's all I need. Um, and he got me, like, iTunes. And I just remember being, I was messed up. I was drunk. I called my dad up, having not talked to him in a while at that point, and I go, iTunes? iTunes, no one listens to iTunes anymore. I was like, I'm gonna cut this up. This is a joke of a gift, send me something else. And I was just, again, so rude, so rude. I, mean, I later found out he got me iTunes because he knows I wouldn't use that and anything else would have been used, you know, on a night out or whatnot. Um, but still, I, to this day, I think iTunes is a horrible gift card to give to someone. <laughs> but it is, but, um, and I, that was like a moment where I just, you know, I turned nasty. I wasn't a nasty drunk, but I was a nasty person when I was, you know, in that mindset. And then, um, I just stopped talking to everyone because everyone else sucked. They were all boring. They, you know, they were judging me. If you were judging me, you weren't on my vibe and you weren't going to be in my lane. So goodbye. And I just cut you off, you know, 
I like not seeing my family for holidays because I don't have to buy the gifts. More money for me, bonus, goodbye. Like it was just these things that if it benefited me to any way or benefited my habit of drinking in any way, I didn't need to see you. Um, and that really hurt because at the time, you know, my parents went through a divorce. My siblings needed me. I could have, I could have cared less. I was like, listen, you know, and I went through a period where I just wanted to be alone because no one else, you know, could drink like me. And if they did drink like me, then they had a problem because they were always sloppy. They were annoying. They were like breathing in your face. Like I couldn't, I could not handle a drunk that was this close in my face. Like I wish, I, I should not say that. I don't wish, I don't wish COVID was around then, but like they were in my face and I could not handle that. Like if I can like just feel your breath like impact my skin when you're drunk even if I'm drunk I can't stand that and like that's what it was like a lot of times so those people I just you know I was like you're a slob and you should be embarrassed for yourself and I just started drinking alone because deep down I knew I was like that you know like I would peep on myself and like I would like there's so many like I would ruin spray tans all the time and it's they're expensive and that was like, you know, like that's embarrassing. And I didn't care. I didn't care. I had no regard to how I looked. As long as like on the outside, if I looked somewhat put together, then it's fine. On the inside, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that I haven't slept in like two weeks. It doesn't matter that I'm like, you know, don't know the last time that I showered. As long as I have like it looking good, we're good. Um, and then eventually... You know, it was a great, beautiful day. I had some friends from high school coming to the city, and I was like, listen, take the train. I'm going to pick you up, and I'm going to show you the best time of your life. You know, we're going to go here, we're going to go here, and by night, we're going to do a nice dinner, and then we'll be drinking. I was like, we're going to get drinks everywhere we go. It'll be so much fun. We'll do some shopping. like, And then I was like, and then we'll come back to my place, and we'll rest for a little bit, have some wine, and then we'll go back out. Like, it's just nonstop so much fun. And they're like, oh, like, we can just hang out. And I was like, no. Like, you're only in New York once. Like, you have to go big. And that's a lie. You're from New Jersey. You're, like, 45 minutes from the city. Like, but that's just how I was. And my one friend, she came. And, you know, we picked her up and went to a rooftop. And it's, like, having a great time. You know, I'm, I'm a little messed up, but it's fine. And, but then it gets like really hot out and I'm like oh gosh I hate when it gets hot like I start sweating like I feel drunker than I am so I'm trying to like wrap this up as much as I'm like this isn't good for, like this is not gonna I was like pretty good at knowing when my drunkness was like gonna end bad and I was like the sun and the heat that's an unneeded factor so I was trying to get out of there and she didn't want to go and I was like all right whatever fine so I just keep drinking and like put some ice in my vodka whatever and all of a sudden, I just go down. And I don't remember anything. I had a full-blown like photo shoot with my best friend. Don't even remember it. Like, um, fell down, flight of stairs, glass stairs. Don't remember it. Um, ended up in the hospital, don't remember it. And that was the last time I ever drank alcohol. Um, it was, it was horrible. It was, uh, April of 2018, and I, I was just like so disgusted, you know. And I was going in and out of like in the hospital, and you know, I was really upset that I threw up on like my white pair of jeans, and like I will always talk about those white pair of jeans because like for some reason they meant a lot to me. Um, and I threw up on them. And my friends are coming from like their baseball game and they had and I'm like, listen, like you gotta come here. I don't know where I am, you gotta come. And we all had each other's locations. So they come to the hospital and they're there and you know they're holding my hand, I'm going in and out. And you know, I have IV I was a mess. Like I my hair was a mess. I was sweating. So like I got my curly hair at the roots and then straight, so I was like electrocuted. And then I had vomit on my bottom half. And then I had like whatever like drink I was drinking like kind of just stained on my chest. And 
I'm going in and out, you know, saying like, I love you guys so much. Thank you for being here. And you guys are the best. And this is crazy. This is so bad. And then I just went out and um, that was it. And I, and I was, you know, not on this earth for a little bit. And luckily I was, you know, level five care and they were amazing doctors there that day. And they brought me back and I was fine. And they say, your dad's five minutes away. And that like sobered me up so quick. And I was like, what? I was like, my dad's coming. And um, I was like, I was like, no, 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 no. Like, tell him not to come, tell him not to come. Like, well, because in the past when this would happen to me, no one called an ambulance. No one called my parents, you know? They were like, all right, put her in the shower. Like, you know the drill, like wake up, you know, a few slaps. Um, my dad came in. And he told the guys to leave, and they were probably just terrified of my father, so they just ran out. And um, they, you know, my dad sat next to me, and I, I said like, please, I was like, please, I want you here, please, like I want my, I want my dad here right now. And that, that was not me saying that, you know, that's my higher power because like, me back then did not want anyone around me, especially my father, who's been in AA at a time and. I knew that he was going to, you know, read me the big book, and, like, I can't go anywhere, I'm hooked to tubes, like, you just got to listen, um, and he did, <laughs> he did, and I was like, Bill's story, and I was like, oh my god, <laughs> please, like, just knock me out, please, and, um, I just started crying and crying, and, you know, he's like, what are you going to do, and I go, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, and he goes, well, are you, are you done? And I go, I, I don't know. And he goes, you want to be done? And I was like, I think so, but like, I'm just so young. And he goes, he goes, yeah, but you almost just died. And I was like, uh-huh. Like, I didn't remember that, or I didn't really, you know, I wasn't acknowledging that, and I did. My dad, um, my dad's one of, like, the strongest men I know, and I admire his recovery so much now that I can, you know, be in a place in my life where I can appreciate it. And he, um, he said, okay, listen, you don't have to get sober, but you can't keep living like this. And he's like, you're going to die. He's like, you almost just died. He's like, I'm not going to lose a daughter. He's like, you're not going to put your family through that. He's like, you're not going to do this to us. You've done enough. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I'm in the hospital right now. You can't be telling me what I've done to this family. Like, I'm in the hospital. This is bad. He pretty much just said, like, no, enough's enough. Like, like don't get sober if you don't want to but you're not going to be in this family and um I wanted to get sober I really did so I was I was I was done you know so um I looked him in the eyes and I said I'm only gonna say this once I was like I want you to help me I want to get sober please take me at home um and that's what he did so you know I eventually got discharged from the hospital and I thought like you know he drove in I thought we we're gonna take the car home no, like, he's, you know, cheapish, sorry, cheap, and parked in Jersey City and took the path in. So, like, I'm literally, like, in a hospital gown because he's an idiot and didn't bring me any clothes. And so I have heels, hospital socks that, that I'm actually wearing tonight because I always wear them when I speak. Um, for the four-year-old hospital socks. <laughs> and um, he, I am so embarrassed on, like, the path train in a hospital gown, like, and my dad, like, I have a hospital bracelet on, people were looking at me, and I was just like, I didn't care, I was like, I just want to go home, I don't want to do this anymore, I don't want to die, um, and I knew what I had to do, you know, like, I'd been hearing it, you know, my whole life, and I'd been hearing it, you know, when I was going to those meetings when I was younger, but I never did any of it, like, I didn't, you know, there was no need for me to do it, there was no risk, you know, there was, I wasn't going to lose anything, I might have, like, you know, lost a few years, whatever, you know, I might, like, you know, someone might think bad about me, there's a million things I do every day that can probably make people think bad about me, I'm not perfect, so I didn't care, but when I was threatened with losing my family, and threatened with, you know, losing my life, you know, and I didn't, I didn't think that was possible, I didn't think I could die, I was too young, and, you know, my alcoholism, like, kills me it does you know whether it's like my health or like my relationships it kills and so um I got sober and that was it you know I 
started going to meetings, I got a sponsor. And I was so nervous to get my sponsor. I was like, home. it was like literally like asking someone to prom. Like it was just so scary. And I was just like, uh, like, do you like want to like go through the big book sometime? Or like, I don't know, like get coffee. And, like it's awkward. And she's like, yeah, sure. Great. Call me tomorrow. And I didn't do it. And so then I saw her at the meeting the next week and she's like, yeah. So I was like, hey, what's up? And she's like, like, well, it gives me like a look. And I was like, oh, she's like, yeah, you never called. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. And she's like, yeah, you're supposed to call your sponsor every week. And I kind of don't think you forgot. So, um, I was like, oh, got it. Great. You're one of those sponsors. So I started calling her every week. <laughs> And I called her every day, and I, you know, every week we had certain things that we like went through. Like one week it was like, you know, like we kind of went through like the topics of the 12 step every week in our phone calls. And, you know, after 12 weeks she was like, all right, let's meet, let's go through the book. And I was just like, oh gosh. You know, I was also like, I also am dyslexic, so like reading a big book was like not going to be for me. Um, and I like literally asked her, I was like, is there like an ebook? Is there you know something like I like I couldn't? I was too nervous to read um, to her, but we did it, and it took me forever to go through the big book, but I got through it. We went through the steps, and like the miracles started to happen. You know, I um, I wasn't that 16 year old that was stealing from her parents or sneaking people in or you know cursing out their parents or you know like just so disrespectful. I became like, you know, like me, I just, be I grew up, like I really did grow up in the program, you know, I just came in when I was 16, I'm 25 now, and like, yes, I don't have like, you know, consistent sobriety, but I have sobriety that I'm proud of, and I have sobriety that like, that I, you know, I respect my sobriety, and there's, you know, it took me a while to respect my sobriety. I used to, you know, in early sobriety, go to bars and go to clubs, because I felt like I had to show people yeah, even though I'm sober, I'm still fun. And I was like, like, it was horrible. I would get home and I'd be like sweating, be like, oh, I got through that, but that was rough. Like, that was so hard. Like, oh my gosh. Like, that's not me respecting my sobriety. Like, I need to respect my sobriety like it's a child. Like, I need to like protect it, you know? And putting myself in those environments was not doing it for me at that time. I mean, now I'm just like old and like I go to bed at like 10 o'clock. So like, <laughs> That's just not gonna happen. <laughs> but yeah, like no, never. And but like, you know, I was talking to my sponsor today. I I eventually got a new sponsor. I went back to the sponsor that I had when I was 16. And um, being back with her has been like amazing because like she's just my girl. Like she's like my like person. She will never say that we're friends, but like I'm convinced we are. Um, but. You know, I, I, I grew up in, you know, the program, you know, I, I grew up through, through the steps. I found myself through doing the steps and, you know, being honest and, you know, like step four was not for me. I literally asked my sponsor if I could type it on Google Docs because I was like, like I, I was like, I can't write this. I can't write this. And I came up with like reasons why like typing it would be better. I was like, I can type faster. I can get more out. And she's like, no, you, you need to write this. Um, and I like showed it to her and she's like, this is a joke, it's like three pages. Like you have a lot more in you. And I was like, fine. Came back with like literally like, half a book and I was like, here, like let's just do this. Like I was like, I didn't want to hold it in. Like once I like let it out on paper, I was like, I don't want to hold it in. But it took me a while. I was lazy and I was stubborn and like I also was going to college the whole time. Like I was always like, I wanted to finish college on time. I was like, listen, so Alcohol took a lot from me. I'm like, if it's not taking my degree, so like, let's wrap this up. So I would, you know, st have study time and then AA time and then like, like you know, AA work time, and that was my life for like the first two years, you know. But I made that decision. I decided that's what I wanted in sobriety, um, and I also just decided that like I wasn't going to let my age or my background, you know, dictate whether like I was a you know, ready for AI. Like, I felt like I needed to know, like, I needed to be, 
I need to like a white male that was divorced and like had an ex-wife that like hated him to be an AA. Like I was like, that's what AA is to me. And like, that just didn't fit. I'm sorry if that fits anyone here. It also fits my dad, so you're not alone. But um, that was really for me like what, so bad to say, I'm so sorry. But like that's, like, I am honest now. Like I would just lie about everything, but I, I'm like honest. I'm like, that's what I thought. Like, any reason not to be in these rooms was, you know, going to work. And eventually I just, you know, accepted AA and I uh, came in and I, you know, I'm in a, tradi- like, I'm in a transition period right now in AA where um, my sponsor tells me I'm growing up, um, which is awesome, but also like not the best feeling ever. Like I don't want to grow up, but um, I, you know, I changed. I like my way of thinking has changed. The way I look at the steps has changed. The way I, you know, when I read the big book, you know, I take in di- every sentence a little different nowadays. You know, when I, I have the same big book I've had since I was 16, and you know, some things that I wrote back then are completely different to you know wh- the way I view it now. Some things are the exact same, and it's really just because you know, you know. I've experienced a lot, you know, I had to grow up a lot earlier than most 25-year-olds, you know, Um, but I don't, you know, take it back. I wouldn't change anything. I, mm, yeah, I wouldn't change anything. (laughs) There's some things, you know, I wish that, you know, there are people that could be here longer or, you know, people that I could have met, but, um, Everyone that I've, you know, come in contact with, like, throughout, you know, the program has shown me so much love and acceptance that I couldn't even give to myself at the time. And now it's, like, the best gift when a newcomer comes in and I see them and I'm like, I know what you're feeling and I know how much it sucks sitting here, but it's just one hour and then you get to go home and watch Netflix and then you come back tomorrow and you do it again and you just do it again until it stops sucking so much. And, like, I'm honest, like, yeah, it sucks in the beginning. It really does. It's not fun. If it was fun, you know, this room would be packed. But, like, no, no, and, like, COVID, and COVID. But, like, but, like, that's the thing. Like, AA is hard, like, getting sober, it's hard work. Like, you're not going to, you know, you have to be up for the challenge. And there are some days where I'm, like, I'm not going to do this, you know. I'm, like, I am going to a meeting and then I'm going straight home. Like, no meeting after the meeting for me. There's some days where I'm like that. And, like, that's okay. But then I know, you know, the next day, I'm showing up early. I'm staying late. Maybe I'll drive someone. Like, I just know that, you know, AA, you know, is not, like, a one-size-fit-all. And I think that what helped me was making it more fun for me, making it more livable for my lifestyle, making it, you know cool, I guess, you know, to be, like, young in AA and getting sober and, you know, learning how to say to people my age that do drink why I don't drink without giving them a whole hour story (laughs) of why I don't drink. But, you know, growing up in the program has taught me so much and it also has given me, like, so much gratitude and so much just, like, freedom within myself and within my life and, like, all these miracles. Like, I've I'm, you know, I'm welcomed in my family, like, a little too welcome sometimes, like, and, you know, I have a great career that I'm, like, obsessed with, and, you know, I have a great partner who, you know, shows me so much love, and I have, you know, amazing friends who support me and will drive the last minute to come see me speak, you know, like, I am so grateful for my life today, but all of that's due to coming to the program and just being open and honest and just, you know, being honest when I'm not doing so good and having no shame in that or a little shame, you know, but just being vulnerable, being myself. And if I don't know who I was at that time, at least saying like, I don't know who I am and that scares me, but I know that I belong here. And uh, that's all I have to say, so thank you. That's great stuff. Let's give this a hand one more time. Hello.
love laughing when the speakers speak, and, and I love learning something. You taught me something tonight. Uh, you know, I was I was old when I was 25. So <laughs> great news. And something I suspected for years. Your dad is really cheap, right? <laughs> no, I'm gonna get. He's gonna kill me. Anyway, we have a nice way of closing. Stay for the meeting after the meeting. Uh, Again, it's customary for us to form a line after we're done when we close up and, and thank our speaker formally to come here at their own time and expense. Take a moment of silence, use it as however you like, and if you care to join us, we'll end with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to the us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good job. Good job.